there was a dark period, nothing happened, everything was in this neutral hydrogen atoms, which was very boring state, and then for the first time some stars formed. Once those stars formed, the light from them came, that also changed the environment around it, and that is what led to subsequent uh, evolution in terms of formation of galaxies, clusters of galaxies. We are part of one such cluster in which we are on, in one of the galaxies, in which there are billions of solar systems of which we belong to one, for which there are many planets, we belong to one of those and so on. Right? So that's the perspective we have here right now. Here, it has taken 14 billion years for us to get from the beginning of the universe to this stage. Okay, next slide. But all this has become possible because of the studies of the sky sitting here trying to infer the patterns that we see of light in the sky. They finally amount to basically taking pictures, taking pictures often enough and monitoring changes and inferring from that what this, what the hell is going on in the universe. But while doing that, the major difference between video and optical is that one optical photon is capable of, it's carrying a lot of energy. The energy is proportional to its frequency. The frequency is in terahertz and if it goes and hits your CCD camera, it will do something to it, right? That's how you use in your mobile phones and or if it hits your retina, it will be jump in some signal. The radio photon is so weak that it will not generate any action of essence in the matter. You can bombard billions of those and nothing will happen to the material. Okay? This way we are handicapped. We do not have CCD like detectors in radio. So we have to depend on the miserable dance or miserable, uh, uh, miserably small amount of change that occurs in the electrons which are, you know, free to move in a metal. So what we do is take pieces of metal, expose them to this. Uh, radiation and then motions of the electrons are affected by the incident radiation. When that happens, we detect the small changes in the current. Motions of electrons are equivalent of current and these oscillations are what we pick. They are so weak, they are in a fraction of a microvolt. Uh, in terms of voltage or micro amperes, in terms of current, and we need to amplify them before we can hear them. Next slide, please. So these are the instruments that we build. We build big, big buckets. We use big buckets to collect light, much like we use lenses to focus light. These, we can also use mirrors, as if you were use an optical. Except now these are in the radio waves and bringing them to some point where we can put our sensors, where we can put our ears. And the ears are going to be what? The ears are going to be pieces of metal in which small currents will be induced and that is what we listen to. Next slide please. These are the telescopes in India which do this kind of observations and they act as radio eyes. There is one working at 10 meter wavelength. This was in Mauritius, used to work at 2 meter wavelength. There is, we have one of the biggest telescopes in, in the world at uh, uh, Naranga Pune in Maharashtra, where uh, we have a radio eye equivalent of 25 kilometers. Okay. Now why is that size required? we will see. So what we have is light coming from the distant object concentrated at some convenient point like focus and we put a sensor there. 
that's where we have our single pixel camera. If you want to take a picture of it, we move our head and turn on our neck to look at different different parts of the sky. Of course, the sky itself is moving, so we need to track. We need to rotate our head to follow it. But what we are really measuring is not is not something very systematic. Our signal is not like communication signal which is sent like Lata Mangeshkar song, right? Our signal is not the picture that we get on the TV. Our signal is what you get as when the station is switched off. Have you ever looked at your TV screen when the signal is lost? In older days, this is how Right? Nowadays they might have some message, they might block the rest of the sort of natural view of it. But if you were to look at your screen when there is no signal coming or the set of box is also not there, you will see a bubbly pattern of noise randomly moving. And that is what is our signal. All that we are measuring is the strength of this bubbly signal depending on each direction. It will look like a random signal. Nothing you can make out in terms of its any pattern in it. And all that you are measuring is what is the loudness of that hiss. Loudness of that hiss depending on the direction and depending on its color and its variation in time is all that we can look for. Next slide. So this is essentially restating the thing. Now we can ask how greedy we can be. Can we have a big pocket so that we can collect more light and we can look at weaker and weaker signals and look at the entire sky, as much part of the sky as possible at a time, but look at it also with fineness and you will find Professor Heisenberg will stop you from being greedy at some stage. Have you heard about Heisenberg's answer principle? Yes, sir. So that is the principle which tells you that you cannot be simultaneously be greedy, okay, in more than one thing. Either you can have your cake or eat, right? You can't have both. So similarly, the momentum and uh, uh, the space location you cannot define simultaneously accurately. And that is tied up with essentially saying that you cannot define the direction of the photon more accurately than the uncertainty that you allow for in its arrival. So you use bigger buckets, you can look at fine angular resolution. Okay? So please go ahead. Uh, uh, so I already said this. Let's go further. I will not worry about uh, what kind of radiation we look at. If there are questions, we can come back to it. The only thing I want to say is the radio sky is not dark at all. It's so bright in radio that even the weakest of the radiation, 3 degree Kelvin, that cosmic microwave background that we talk about, is always there. And that itself produces enough shower of photons enough rain of photons that we are always bathing in photons at radio. That's not true in optical. Optical you might get from a distant object, one photon now, one photon, you know, ten minutes later, because each one of them is carrying huge amount of energy, and so they don't come very often. Whereas in radio, the photons are weaker, and there are large, large number of them. Go ahead. Um, so this is the same thing said in different ways. Optical photons in a short interval that we look at might be there or might not be there in every wagon. Whereas in radio, every wagon is filled with photons. Okay. Go ahead. So this is saying the same thing. We can go further. This is just to refresh our memory what we are really trying to measure. Next slide, please. And I already stated. Professor Heisenberg's uh, uh, you know, control on us that we cannot be demanding everything. 
Either we have a big bucket, in which case we can be more sensitive, we can listen to a very tiny place. But then we are looking at a very narrow part of the sky. And that's we will need to turn our head to complete the picture. Okay, go ahead. This is the same thing stated here. Now the real problem is, as I said, we are looking at random phenomena. In that randomness, we are trying to measure the intensity. Okay? While measuring the intensity, it is like asking, now the measurement that we get is such that we are looking for some intensity of the sound that we want to measure. Sound in this particular case, radio sound. It's not sound waves. While we measure the intensity, we know that if we take one measurement now, one measurement later, each time we take a measurement, when we, the measurement themselves are changing, we will find that it is wrong by 100%. Each measurement is wrong by 100%, which is like, if I hear a rumor more, right? How will I find out whether the rumor has any truth? I hear some news, okay, and I am told that it can be, what I heard can be wrong by 100%. What will I do? I will ask large number of people, right? Hoping that you all don't decide to say, let's boom the page and tell him the same wrong thing, right? As long as you are wrong, or different from the truth by different ways or different amounts, I can ask large number of you and find out what is the common thing you say. And that I will take as a truth. Right? Even if each one of them, each one of you could be wrong by large amount. And this tiny bit of truth in the middle of lots of lies, okay, can be found out if I ask large number of people. So it turns out that when I have light collected over a large so-called bandwidth or color range of the order of megahertz, that means mega cycles, I can get million samples or you know correspondingly large number of measurements in one second. And so I can get large number of measurements and if I have million measurements, I can get to the truth by a factor of 1 upon square root of million. So I can be closer to the truth by a part in 1000. Isn't that great? Now I can measure something with an accuracy of a part in 1000. My accuracy will depend on how many people I ask. Right? The truth is buried in lots of lies. The only hope is that when she tells me something and she adds some lie, it is different from what he tells me as a truth plus the lie that he has. The truth is common, the lies are different. Okay. So this is the entire aspect on which all the sensitivity of measurements in astronomy are based on. We just need, we have to hungry about the number of people in the past. Okay? And more we ask, better we get in the truth. Okay, so uh, I'll not worry about this, how it's done in practice. You know, this is something that we learn when you uh, stages where all that. But what we have is a simple radio or like like the TV receiver. What that is do? It collects some signal, amplifies it, and then presents it in certain form where it can be measured or viewed. And that's what we will try to do. So let's go ahead. So essentially, we want to drive home this point that your ability to distinguish between different directions is decided by the wavelength and the size of your eye. You can do this sum yourself after this. If you want to know the resolution of our eye has, how do you do that? You will choose your you will choose your favorite color for wavelength 
for which you know the lambda, and ask what is the size of our eye, the aperture, and maybe it's half a centimeter or something, and do the sum lambda divided by t, and that will give you the ability to resolve or separate out different directions uh, in radians, and it will come out to be almost what is it? 10,000th of a radian. Okay? Is something that we can distinguish. Now, if you want to do the same thing at 1 meter wavelength, you can easily see that you require 10,000 meters of a radio eye. What is 10,000 meters of radio eye? 10 kilometers. You need to build 10 kilometer size radio eye. You cannot build a single piece. So people have found a way around and said that we will small, small measurement. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Okay, I will not worry about this again unless there are questions. Go further. Go further. Go further. Go further. Yeah. So we build telescopes either as big as kilometers as single piece to get appropriate angular resolution or build arrays a large number of small small antennas or small small of receptions across a large area which is what the GMRT is the great, uh, giant meter wave radio telescope uh, if you go ahead to the next slide yeah uh, so people build arrays of dishes, each one of them is a pocket and by comparing the similarity of signals received at different different locations, there are standard techniques to find out information about the sky with the detail corresponding to the separation between the antennas and that can be increased to many kilometers, many tens of kilometers, many hundreds of kilometers and even thousands of kilometers which is spanning the entire earth. There are earth size telescopes okay, which can now give you an ability you can make a big radio eye like that and you can view the sky with very fineness uh, the desired fineness. So I will skip this this is just a piece of electronics you require whenever you have and that's what I said it will be looking like your typical radio uh, handheld radio that you use to use or, or the receiver in your TV uh, will not go through the details of this except you need to amplify the signal you need to make it sound louder and louder so that we can hear it go ahead next one go ahead so this I already talked about this is basically stressing the fact that how weak this you can hear will depend on how many people you ask okay to each one of them telling you 100 percent lie but you know saying truth go ahead go ahead so the technique that is used is for constructing big telescopes using small small telescope or equivalent big telescope is the principle of interferometry and this is nothing but what you already learned in your school. Have you done any optics experiments? Which ones? Single slit experiment? Hmm? The single slit experiment like having a single dish, single aperture telescope. And when you have you done young double slit experiment? Wonderful. If you if you look at what we are doing here, is exactly young experiment. And you will find all the non things that you can incorporate in that experiment. If you can ask, instead of a point source, if you had taken a slightly bigger source, what would happen to the fringes that you see, dark and bright matches? They will reduce in their intensity contrast if you make a bigger hole in the initial cardboard. Right? And that's what we are exploiting. We are trying to measure the pattern of holes you will make you can make in that initial cardboard and how does that change the fringe contrast 
The fringe contrast can be measured with different different spacings of your and you will see these fringes in the sky exactly the way you see in the young double sphere experiment. Now the height of these fringes will diminish based on what kind of hole pattern you have in the cardboard. If you make it very tiny, of course, depending on regardless of the separation of the slits, you will see the same brightness. You might see the separation between the bands vary. Go ahead. So this is just, uh, I think, more detail of it. So this is how one builds up big telescopes. You can build and so in principle you have one double slit experiment, a pair of antenna. You can measure all the information that you want by putting them at different different separations, different different orientations. But that will take forever. Lifetime will not be enough. So somebody can take pity on us and say, I will give you money for getting N slits. Suddenly what you can do? You can arrange the N slits so that you can make N into N minus 1 by 2 combinations, N C2 combinations of it. And all those can be made, used to measure things simultaneously. Go ahead. So you can actually build up the effect of a big dish or big radio eye even of the size of the earth by using small small sensors and using them in combinations of equivalent of M double slit. Go ahead. So I will not go through the detail. We can get very fine details and people have been imagining these uh, beautifully. Uh, these are just some pictures. I will not worry about what they are. If you go to the next slide. So details of the kind which were uh, almost impossible to get by building small telescopes has now become possible to study in great detail. Uh, that's just a local object, Jupiter magnetosphere. Next slide please. These are some, uh, uh, I think, super remnants. Go ahead. This is the detail that I showed you initially about the center of our galaxy and what we are looking at here is a resolution which is fraction of the arc second. Some hundred times finer than our uh, optical eye. And you can go and zoom on to these details. Each one of these details can be studied further and further. Of course, what it will require is a bigger and bigger telescope. And this is really going to the earth size station. So now what we have, your generation is going to see some of the most sensitive and biggest telescopes that we built. These are called square kilometer arrays. These are international projects. And these are driven by our quest for bigger and better and more sensitive instruments. And these will be achieved and some of you in your uh, career might even end up working with them or you know making them happen. So uh, I'll skip over this. There are disturbances that trouble us while making these measurements. Next slide please. Next slide please. Okay, so this is how the telescopes, this is the artist's impression of how the telescopes are going to look like. Okay. But why this happens in this in the universe, uh, in the world, not in the universe. Uh, for students to get opportunity to dirty their hands and actually make uh, real observations on the sky using equipment that is otherwise not available to them. Raman Institute has taken the initiative to set up an array of telescopes across India where there will be instruments located in individual colleges. Initially, the demonstration system will have eight such instruments located in eight different uh, institutes across India. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the agenda here, the scientific agenda, there are some mysterious 
leaps of light seen in the, from the sky, which are called fast radio bursts, which I don't know whether you heard of. Have you heard of such signals? Any reports? Okay. What is seen is pulsars like signals where you hear the signal in a repeated fashion, one after another, separated by a certain milliseconds or seconds. But here, strangely, signals coming from very distant object appearing only for a few milliseconds. Never before, never again later. Is heard. And we do not know what objects would have produced this shout. This has taken the world by uh, surprise and everyone across the world is searching for origins of these signals and there are searches being conducted from everywhere. We will also be wanting to do that where students have access to this information, they are doing these observations and there will be eight such stations set across India. Go ahead. So this is the Lorimer first, it's known by so one of our friends, Duncan Lorimer, found this instances in some data. And then people have looked at it uh, from even the data that they had for a long time. And so far about 200 such instances have been detected. People believe that in a day almost tens of thousands of such events might be occurring. We may not be listening to them. So what you see actually, you see a chirp signal. It's like a bird chirp. If a bird were to sing the radio and have a producer chirp, its sound will be heard at certain frequency, with certain tone, at, and the tone will change as a function of time. Right? That's how a chirp sounds. Such signals are seen and they actually tell you how far they come. So much so, if you go further, next slide please. So, uh, such signals can be produced from elsewhere also. Sometimes they can be traced to somebody having a wrong uh, kind of uh, microwave oven and not having patience to uh, heat the object, look inside and open the door might produce these signals. So we need to separate out what human beings are producing or what machines on the uh, earth are producing versus what is really coming from the sky. That is a big challenge. So this is how the signal will actually look like in, if we monitor the color or frequency of it as a function of time. Go ahead, next one. The important thing is people now believe that these signals are coming from external galaxies. If you put them at external galaxies, sound that we hear, they have to be ultra-energetic sources. Nobody knows how to produce such ultra-energetic sources. Okay? So, go ahead. Next one. I will not go through these details, but just uh, fast forward further. Fast forward. Fast forward. As I said, large number of people have been looking at it all the time now. Next slide please. Next slide. Next slide. So what we require is large number of stations in India which are looking at the same part of the sky and if both of them or all of them hear it, we will be sure that it's coming from the sky and not from some local tower. Right? So go ahead. Next one. Next one. Right. Next slide please. Okay. So the second idea is that JMRT, this biggest telescope in India, gives you angular resolution of certain kind and it's 25 kilometer uh, dimension. We now, with this network, will produce a telescope of many thousand kilometers. And if you go to the next slide uh, further. Further, further. We'll skip to the half. Ah, okay, next one. So this is how it will look like if you take all the institutes, let's say IITs or NITs or you know ISERs or other universities across India. 
if you have plenty of that in order that we will produce india size telescope okay that's the idea this is how it has begun now we have put together antenna arrays eight such in dorevidur you can come and visit that some equipment which was already built for some other purpose has been stolen and redeployed to make eight stations this was used for this study in the pulsar in this fashion so go ahead next one next one ha ah. so this is where the recovery window the tiles exist and this is a nice sketch produced by one of our students uh, when i asked her to show where the locations of the, the this antenna zar this informality associated with this drawing is at the heart of this project <coughs> where students are allowed to come in and participate in it in an uninhibited way i tell them that they can even you know do anything wrong even if it amounts to burning the system is fine right we will fix it so uh, so what sort of things have happened over the last two years and we are now ready to relocate this from dobri bidur to individual institutes natural at the individual institutes will begin very soon and you can find out which is the nearest institute for you or is it going to be that you can right now log in from anywhere across the world to this telescope system and make your own observations these are the kind of fringes that i was talking about this is actually signals from the sky seen through an equivalent double slit experiment go ahead next one next one so these are depending on the slit separation you will see different different bands and they all these are being put together and there was a next slide please go ahead next one ah okay so this is how already even at gauri vidur we are trying to by using tiny elements of few meters in size we are trying to get a telescope of 200 meters okay and this is what students have done they found out how this what measurements of the young double slit experiment what separations we can measure and there was an imaging challenge him recently in which they actually made the observations themselves and produce an image of 100 square degrees of the sky with a water degree resolution and the excitement that they had is uh, unmatched it's not given in any classroom next slide please so we will be uh, now moving on uh, with this phase and now we will be trying out the slit separations of the order of 1000 kilometers okay very so and the first source that we will be imaging or at the image is this famous brightest source in the sky it's called cygnus a which is as i said is galaxy which has got fine details which will be seen only when we go to the india size telescope in doing that it's only a coincidence that cygnus means swan okay all right we are having fun with other activities which i will not go into we are also considering if we can fly a drone to make the calibration measurements next slide please and uh, next one so i'll probably stop here and say that your generation has the opportunity actually not only learn about it but contribute to making big radio eyes which will change the perception we have about the universe by making detailed observations and in general you know unraveling the mysteries of the universe that is for us